Hey everyone, welcome back to the vlog. It's me. I'm starting a new vlog today because it's the weekend and I'm going to get tattooed. I saw my grandma last week and she said, oh, will you stop getting any more of those drawings on you? So of course, I booked another one in. Um, this is actually one I have booked from lockdown, getting my legs, starting on my legs, getting my legs tattooed. So that's why I'm wearing cycling shorts and then this shirt, which is like a really cute, linen number from the car boot sale is actually just for Conran but it's so comfy and I just have a vest top on underneath it's like really muggy weather in Brighton today it's like not sunny but just extremely hot um having a nice like graduation celebration weekend um and my mum's coming down tomorrow um with my dog I'm going out for a meal which is really nice and I'll show you that as well <laughs> from town got tattooed I don't know how much I showed you of town we also went for some pints and I accidentally ordered two seven percent drinks so don't blame me um woo. can I show you I'm actually gonna take this off because I think it's done this is what I got this cool lady you're a cool lady. Thanks. <laughs> um, but I also came home to loads of book now that I wanted to show you. Let me put you down. Is that okay? Mm, I'm not showing you very good angles. Anyway, I'll put a picture on my Instagram. And if you're interested in the tattoo artist, I get tattooed by, he also did my Ocean Vong one and this little leopard guy. So I love him. He's very organized. I love that. I went candlestick mad in Tiger. You guys know my drip drip candle gin bottle situation. So I got these new colours. They're really cheap in Tiger. These are the ones we went for. They're 50p each. And they burn quite a long time and I quite like them. They're like not, I don't know, they're not like a block colour. They're sort of like a bit chalky. And then I got this one because it was on sale and it's like a twisty one. Um, what else did I get in town? Didn't buy anything exciting. I'm on a bit of a home buy ban, except candles obviously they melt. I bought my mum this cute new lunch box because she was on the look for a new lunch thing. And this is what I got her. A little plaid number and tiger. Um anyway, book post. The cutest package from the, my friends at Atlantic Books. I love them. It says, Hi anxious to meet you. <laughs> I think it's really funny. And it's promo for the book, Everyone in This Room Will Be Dead Someday, by Emily Austin. They actually sent me a finished copy, which is very kind. It looks like this. And it's um, penned as a new flea bag, Nisha Dolan, like millennial novel. And it's about, as the title suggests, dying. And um, atheism and I think also lesbianism. Did I make that part up? That's look, it's a debut. Um, looking at the human condition, a deceased, she replaces a deceased receptionist. Oh yeah, she's queer and an atheist working in a church. Sounds fun. We'll read it for Pride Month. Um, and I also got some fun badges. And then one other book that I'm so excited for came in the post this morning. That is The Body Keeps the Score. My Body Keeps, The Body Keeps the Score is a book I've already read. Wow, Hannah, fear going to your head. 
My Body Keeps Your Sick Secrets Dispatches on Shame and Reclamation by Lucia Osborne Crowley. I love Lucia's um, Instagram. She wrote an amazing piece on illness in the pandemic, which I have linked previously, but I will link again. And this is her new book coming out with Indigo Press. So lovely Jordan over there sent it to me and it's all about owning a body in the 21st century but I think it looks at sexual assault, gender identity, um, period, sexual pleasure and the darker secrets of abuse and violation. Um, Lucia lives with chronic illness and I think it's going to touch on that in relationship to owning a body and also her experiences of sexual violence and survival. I'm very very much looking forward to this one, I think it's going to be a heavy read but a really good read. Other book post I got early in the week that I haven't shared. Oh, Men Want to Know by Nina Bore, I want to say. This won the English Pen Award. It's translated, I want to say, from the French, but maybe it's from the German. Let me look. Please hold, caller. Please hold. Oh, it just says translated. It doesn't say translated from what. But um, it's a autofiction. You know I love autofiction. Looking at her life between two countries, France and Algeria. Her upbringing, violence, um, being queer and an unspeakable attack on her mother, then moving to 1980s Paris and her coming of age there. This sounds absolutely brilliant. Um, I love also fiction. I feel like it's going to be in the realm of... <sighs> Why can't I think of any also fiction writers? Uh, Brian Washington or... Derek Awusu, or maybe even um, Nina Minion Powell's essay collection that I read recently. This sounds sort of like harking to the same themes. Um, that's published by Penguin, and I believe it's out now. And the final book, which I'm so excited, is the memoir of Michelle, Michelle Zayna, who is Japanese Breakfast, and this is called Crying in H Mart. You would have seen this all over bookstagram because lots of american bloggers have got it i think it's out in america already but it doesn't come out in the uk till august i believe and yeah it's a memoir of food family grief endurance and life as an asian american in oregon which i'm so excited for so she, um michelle's family come from korea which i have mentioned in here before me and tom took a trip there and we absolutely fell in love with so so I'm excited to relive some of those like culinary and like experiences we had there through her book and I've heard it's beautiful on grief and being mothered so looking forward to that one as well so that's my book post for now I'm off to take a pre-beer post-beer nap and then I'll get back to you tomorrow folks I am off to meet my mum she's coming down to do a little bit of a like graduation celebration situation um with our dog my grandma's not coming because she's too unwell which is sad but I thought I'd just show you what I'm wearing today it's so sunny I'm kind of disturbed <laughs> like I'm worried about how hot it is for me and my dog but I've got a nice orange lip on and a pink eye which is quite random. It's Glossier, like one of the lid stars. I don't actually like them that much because you need to set them with a powder. Otherwise they just go everywhere. These earrings, which I wore in a recent video and you guys love, they're actually um, clip-on. I got them at a car boot sale, I think, or on an eBay job lot. Can't remember. And then I'm so hot. So I've got this like little linen dress on. My new tattoo is out in action. Um, I want to take a photo. My mum bought me this literally two pound hat. It's so poorly made. I want to take a photo for my grandma. Um, so I had to wear a dress that covered most of my tattoos and I've also like picked all of my skin up here. Nice. So I can't wear like anything sleeveless. So I found this in the cupboard. Don't remember when I bought it. It's definitely vintage. It's missing the bell, which is kind of annoying, but it's still cute. She's a graduate baby. Um, my favourite handbag my mum bought me last year, two years ago. So I look like an adult. We're going to the garden centre, that nice one 
it's called One Brighton, it's in Stanmore Park, if you guys are local. I showed it a couple of vlogs ago, up with some friends, and I'm taking my mum there, because she loves garden centre, and then we're going to Shelter Hall, which you've also seen before, but it's like that massive food court thing, and it plays live jazz on a Sunday afternoon, so that'll be really nice. And then I'm just working my news editor this morning, and I promise I will come and talk to you about books, but I've got a really busy week, I've got two full days at the hospital. Ooh. Um, tomorrow and Tuesday so then I'll probably just update you after that because I'm going to do a ton of reading while I'm there so yeah hope you guys are having a lovely day and I'll catch up with you soon going through a real Starbucks hibiscus iced tea phase. I got obsessed with this when I went to America a few years ago. It's called like passion tea over there but it's really hard to, for ages you couldn't get it in England and then my friend the other day was like, oh, have you tried the new the new hibiscus iced tea from Starbucks? I was like, no, they brought it back. So now I'm addicted to it. So thanks Jenny, wasting me £3.50 every time I drive past Starbucks. Anyway, I'm in a bit of treat yourself mood because um, in the last two days I think I've had 80 needles in my arm and I'm fucking over it. <laughs> Do you ever just get that where like I'm sick of other people touching me like it's not even that painful, some of it is but in the grand scheme of painful things that have had happen to me it's not that bad but I'm just kind of over feeling like a test tube, I don't know. Anyway, that's me done for the week. Um, and I'll go back next week for the same again, baby. Um, so I, I'm eating. Whoa, washed out. Pit of chips. Delicious. Anyway, let me tell you what I'm reading. So, in the hospital. I'm switching between audiobook and physical book and then napping. A classic combination when you are unwell. Um, my eyes look so swollen because they're basically injecting me with stuff I'm allergic to. So all day I've been like, oh, it's so itchy, you want to gouge my eyes out. Um, I've been listening to Black Wife by Kim Gattas. This was one of Tom's top picks from Last year he has the physical book, I think it's like 500 and something pages. I got the audio book, it's like 15 hours. I'm going through a real phase of like substantial meaty non-fiction on audio. I think it's because I have a lot more time to listen to audio. Um, with like long days in the hospital, driving more myself and like obviously not having to like stop and start because of uni and stuff. So I'm really like sinking into that feeling right now of like really enjoying intensely long quite dry audio books um which i appreciate it's not everyone's taste but so black wave is about basically the history of the like the recent history of the middle east like the multiple revolutions that they've had um each chapter is loosely based on a different country so far we've listened to iran afghanistan egypt saudi arabia Pakistan. Is that it? I think that's all we've covered so far. And it basically, it's so hard for me to synthesize the information that I've listened to in the 11 hours so far because it's an extremely complex set of social and political history in the Middle East. A lot of it is about sort of disseminating a lot of the myths around Islam and how um, Saudi Arabia had obviously gained a lot of money through oil and then had been underwritten by the US and used that to control the rhetoric around fundamental um, Islam in that part of the world. It's extremely interesting. It's, it's definitely dense and you have to have, I guess, some kind of like foundational knowledge into the workings of the Middle East and I still feel a bit lost um, 
even though this isn't the first book or like piece of cultural thing that I've absorbed about this um, time and place. So it's mostly set in the 70s, coming forward we're now in the 90s in Egypt, so we've covered like the cultural revolution in Iran, um, secularism versus like um, religious fundamentalism and then it's really <coughs> interesting right now talking about a lot about the Quran and the um, the way that Saudi Arabia and particularly some Muslim like um, Orthodox Muslim fundamentalist groups had used the translation using the translation and the money that they had for the publishing houses they were building that were like state government publishing houses how they had used that money to rewrite history essentially and rewrite aspects of the um religious teachings to suit their political agenda which is like so effed up um it does talk a lot about or like so far it's touched on education particularly in relation to education in saudi arabia and sort of the dual um position that a child must hold in like public and personal and understanding that maybe their family don't believe in what's being indoctrinated into school so how do they navigate those spaces as young people and that I'm finding really interesting obviously from an educator's perspective and just the idea of how we can manipulate information in with like capitalism behind us in order to create entire nations that believe in something that they thought they never wanted to believe in if that makes sense um it touches on colonialism particularly like the um like India and the partition and Pakistan and then how Pakistan moved into like different religious groups were born out of that um expulsion and that's like a whole co it's a very complex <laughs> set of discussions I feel like I'm not doing a very good job of talking about it but it also touches on very much through like the feminist lens and the idea of obviously touched on religious dress which is like a very like a topic that's often raised in western media when we talk about um countries in the middle east and women's autonomy which is really interesting and the way it's framed in this is very much about the manipulation of the text again and also how like huge male leaders no matter where in the world they're talking or who they are or what religion they claim to be from feel that, like feel like they can dictate who and what women can be which is just so messed up like we see it in america we see it in the uk with reproductive rights as well as in the states of reproductive rights and you can hear about it in this book in the middle east about education and work and careers and dress and male guardianship and all those things that are now levied at the east as like from a western perspective it's like oh women are like they're so regressive over there women are so oppressed and actually it's a it's a very minute portion of the population of those countries of the men in those countries who believe those things and because it suits the um in particular like the saudi arabian government which is like a lot of the Saudi Arabian leadership is underwritten, like I said, by the US, by oil, by all those other capitalist endeavors. It benefits the West to have people believe that those places, those women are oppressed, which in some cases they are oppressed and there is a lot of issues to do with autonomy. But it's sort of like these narratives are spun in a way to make us believe there's only one story to be told basically. Um, but I'm really, really enjoying it. It's a really, really interesting read. Um, definitely one I will go back to. Tom's got the physical copy, as I said, and I would have liked that to be able to highlight it, but it's in the Netherlands. And then I'm reading Natasha Brown Assembly. I bought this on a whim because look how short it is. And I can't resist when someone releases a new short book. I'm like, give it to me. Give me the 100 pages. It's a very fragmentary style. I feel like this won't be for everyone. It's very much in that ilk of like Jenny Offal, but maybe less. It is fragmentary, but it's um, sort of like on the same page, you'll touch on three different conversations, but you will understand how they are all linked together. So it's like very, um, who described it here as formally innovative says so Sophie McIntosh and I would agree is a, is a very interesting structure that she's using to I wouldn't say it's as um experimental as like Max Porter and Rebecca Watson but it's sort of airing on that idea of like inside the mind of someone like train of train of thought consciousness but it's split into that fragmentary style so 
it's I'm super short I read 78 pages of it just today um but I wanted to read you a couple of bits so essentially it's about a um young black woman who works in finance and she is um dating this guy who is um like a white man from like old money in London and they're spending the weekend at his parents house um celebrating their anniversary and this sort of is juxtaposition between her position and her, her personal financial success and how she came to um like buy her own property and you know the idea of like climbing the ladder as a child of um non-white parents in the UK and some of those ideas and then her position in society as viewed from her boyfriend's parents who are like old-fashioned probably racist um it's very sharp in tone it reminds me of like UK Halle Butler it like reminds me also of Olivia Sujet's book the way that she builds up they build up tension um but it's also like very beautiful prose in occasion, particularly when she talks about um, like romance. So beside me sleeping, he is formless as water, unperturbed by the day's anxieties, he breathes steadily. With him, I've become more tolerable of the Louis and Merricks of this world. His acceptance of me encourages theirs. His presence vouches for mine, assures me that I am the right sort of diversity. In turn, I offer him a certain liberal credibility, negate some of that old money political baggage assure his position as left of center i loved that it's just like very sharp very clever she's talking about going to this party and she said i will be watched that's the price of admission they want to see my reactions to their abundance P polite restraint concealed outrage a base des desire hunger beneath i must play the part with the veneer the new millennial money coolness serving up those savage witticisms alongside the hors d'oeuvres it is a fictionalization of who i am but my engagement transforms the fiction into truth. My thoughts, my ideas, even my identity can only exist as a response to these party goers' words, articulated along the perimeter of their form, reinforcing their selfhood and their centrality to mine. How else can they be certain of who they are and what they aren't? Delineation requires a sharp black outline. Just really clever commentary on the position of race in the UK right now. Um, interracial relationships and navigating boardrooms and like financial careers really really enjoying it hey friends it's so hot in england today i'm sweating profusely just thought i'd let you know that anyway um i finished assembly wow that's upside down um this morning so i read it in basically two chunks and i really really enjoyed it it's potentially could be frustrating in its shortness to some people but I'm a huge fan of short books that are especially sharp in their observations very much like a snapshot in time of a particular incident so I think I mentioned in the last clip it's essentially about um the choice who you represent yourself as um in regard to race and class and sort of coming into your own identity and how your identity is essentially dependent on the observations and interactions you have with others like you don't exist as your own person without the complicity of other people in your life if that makes sense um so then when you are up against people who don't um so I'm just looking out at the people just next to me Ruth thinking wow I could could I climb out there and sit on it <laughs> anyway uh yeah how to um how you navigate those spaces when you come into contact with people who aren't necessarily aligned with your worldview or even the way that they view you um particularly when it comes to race and the idea of being viewed as less than um it's an interesting maybe not wholly formed observation into neoliberalism and capital girl boss culture um but I think it made some really interesting points on that front. Definitely one I'd recommend. Definitely an author I'll buy going forward. Um, it also linked up to a podcast that I listened to this morning called Inga Company by Otega Awapa, who wrote um, White, who also has another, her memoir, like, slash non-fiction book on money is coming out later this year. Um, and she interviewed Paris Lees, which if you watched my 
vlog a few weeks ago, you know, I just read Paris Lee's like stylized memoir and I absolutely loved it. I feel like I, I didn't vlog me finishing it. Um, and then it also w wasn't in last month's wrap up because I finished like two days after I filmed that, but I absolutely adored it. And I feel like listening to her speak to Otega on the podcast really cemented all of these thoughts I was having about the, cho the language choices that she made in the book and the way she was talking about the choice to stylize her life, life experience instead of writing a straight up memoir and the self-protection and preservation that comes from living in a oppressed um, life experience. And I just, it was a brilliant, brilliant podcast. And it made me, sometimes you get, I think when you listen to an author talk about their work, it sort of either reignites or adds another layer of why you loved it so much. Like when I listen to Ocean Vong talk about his work and his books I'm like god you're so smart I love you um even more than if I just read it and sometimes I think I find that really useful in particular in books that maybe I didn't get fully the first time around that I would like to hear someone then talk about it so I could understand more and I think I'm definitely going to do that with assembly so I actually won a giveaway on Instagram tickets to the stylist um literary festival and they had an interview with Natasha Brown which I'm hoping to listen to and then uh talk more about it but um yeah, so that's a shout out to that memoir that I feel like I haven't raved about enough. But um, if you saw me raving about my broken language earlier in the year, this is like on that level. I've got I've read so many good memoirs this year already. It's effed up. How am I ever going to choose which ones are my favourite? I might even have to do top 10 um, memoirs of the year because there's too many to choose from. Um, what else was I going to say this morning? Uh... Chimando and Gozi Adichie published this letter, um, essay on her website about um, sort of like part self-defense, part like weirdly hyperbole on um, like the sanctimonious nature of social media, which some of it I did really agree with. I think by the time you watch this, I would have made a whole video about it and that sort of uh, mob mentality that we see on the internet but I thought it was really interesting because it, it tied into what I listened to Paris talk about and then also what I just listened to in Black Wave. Um, so in the Paris Lee's interview she spoke about this idea of like having to constantly defend your um, your position as a trans woman and how anytime she does an interview or even talks about this book most people just want to ask her like hard questions and she often feels like she's in a position where she needs to defend her identity and then also like um sort of be a spokesperson for an entire group of people and I think that was really interesting and um she then spoke about like social mobility and rising and now like identifying as someone who has like capital and um cu cultural and like economic capital is able to finance her life and make choices that make her life as a trans person easier i.e like the clothes she buys the makeup she buys the facial surgery she's had and how access to those things has like exponentially made her life as a trans person easier and more enjoyable and how we shouldn't shy away and how she's often said she's called out for being like you know neoliberal or pro capitalism and these kind of ideas and this i think it it's that like you must if you are if you are someone who speaks about your marginalised experience, you therefore become a spokesperson for it. And then everything you say is taken in to the utmost degree of seriousness. And that links to what um, this essay that Chimamanda wrote was talking about. And when um, she references what Amezi had said about um, like a proverbial murdering of her or the cancellation of her and sort of sort of if we didn't spend so much time talking and arguing and oppressing people for their identity in in this case trans women or and non-binary non people then we, we could actually get on with living and making society more equal and I think that's what Paris was saying was like if we didn't if people just gave me a chance to talk about anything other than my transness then I could just be seen as a writer or a journalist or all of these other things like why does the byline of my life have to be I'm a trans person and I think that sort of is what um Amezi's conversation is about as well is like maybe we just spend less time or less energy like if, if cis people spent less energy trying to unpick and pick apart someone else's 
life choices, identities, gender expression, then we could get on with doing other things. And I really felt for Paris in the interview and I feel for Amezi as well in that idea of being boxed in. Um, and another thing that this is such a ramble and I feel like this is not a coherent video and that's what you get when you watch my vlogs instead of my sit down videos. But um, in Black Wave, they're talking about the censorship in Egypt and the banning of books and the rewriting of history and it does make me think that there is still real concrete and extremely dangerous censorship happening around the world that is, you know, people are being are being killed and, and murdered and assassinated in parts of the world for their um their beliefs. And in Black Wave she talks about like intellectual terrorism, this anti-intellectualism that is so rife when we talk about um, social progression and religion and the, all these interactions and how that is the day-to-day -day experience of some people like how Paris talks about the day-to-day -day experience of walking down the street and being feared that someone's going to kill her because of her transness and the same in black wave these people who are putting their life on the line to talk about um, or talk up against a regime or a government and are being censored for it and being killed for it and it's sort of when you when you read and think about things like that it really puts into perspective this idea of online cancellation and people losing out and smear campaigns against writers and, and, and journalists when those people are still making money, they are still successful, they are still being read widely and enjoyed widely by groups of people. There is there is this idea that that is the be all and end all of, of censorship, that like, oh my goodness, we're censoring people by by me as a person suggesting that I won't read Jim Amanda's books, I'm therefore censoring other people. And that firstly isn't the case. And I don't think, I don't think it's a worthwhile conversation to be had. And, but also that is going on in other parts of the world and there is real censorship happening and it has throughout history. So the way we've co-opted so much of this language to suit our really quite like non plus conversations going on on the internet about a very small group of people seems like quite flippant in some ways um we was talking to my girl just friends earlier about it and Kieran was referencing like particularly I mean it's across all social justice issues but the language of like fascism or um do the work or like these these redundant phrases that are rolled out in this infographic industrial complex that we see online and they really mean nothing. Like, please just say what you mean. So if you are a transphobe and you're showing yourself as a transphobe, then I'm going to call you that because that's what you're showing yourself as. I don't know, this is a very rambling set of thoughts, but I'm um, going to go back and read, pick up a new book and then tell you about it later once I go to the beach. Tom got a new print from this. What are they called? Black Lines. Black lines. It's like a Euro print, but it's not. A, you got it upside down, baby. Oh. Not a fair. Whoa, I love it. Yeah, it's cool. Oh my god, sick. We appreciate tasteful football related artwork. I don't know if it's sold out, but I will link it down below. I'm going to do work in a cafe. How novel. So I'll just show you my outfit. A fun little safari print, vintage shirt, um, terry cloth and other stories via eBay shorts. Birkenstocks, I just bought new ones actually, I just copied Grace. New cute tap, water bottle. And I experienced some head pain, so I just put one of these, which I don't know if I've spoken about in a video yet. Please hold collar. They're called Better Days. Oh, I do remember speaking about them. Um, they really helped me with my endo flare last week, uh, the big ones on my belly, so I'm testing this one on the back of my neck for neuro pain. I'll let you know how I feel about it. Anyway, catch you at the cafe. I don't know why I didn't put my jumper on before I did my makeup. Maybe I was secretly wishing it was going to stay warm. Hi friends, I'm here. Oh, just leaned on my face in my white jumper so I shouldn't be allowed white things. Tom's going to be angry that I'm even wearing this to lunch. Um, we're going to meet some family for lunch we haven't seen in a while. My hair looks very greasy. 
but I wanted to update you on a book and sign off the blog. So I think I've read this entire thing and I don't think I updated you about it at all. This is Sevastopol by, watch me butcher my Portuguese, Emilio Freire? Brain? Yeah, something like that. Um, published by Lolly Editions, who are really cool. Um, independent, oh my God, there's a massive fly. Independent, um, publisher that focuses on translations is translated from the Portuguese and Emilio is um, Brazilian. He's coined as one of the new Brazilian writers. So this is like a collect, it is it's like, it is three separate stories and it is, but I wouldn't say it's a short story collection because three doesn't seem like enough to make it a collection. Okay? And he says in, he did a really great interview. I will like to say now, this is a very like, big brain energy book and it took me a lot to read and like understand some of the um symbolism and imagery that he was going for because as the title suggests Sevastopol is based off of Tolstoy's um book the sketches of Sevastopol which was like the precursor to War and Peace like a lot of the sort of like research and like ideas that went into War and Peace started in that book. Um, haven't read War and Peace, as I'm sure that doesn't surprise many of you. I'm not a literature student and uh, that's a really long book. <laughs> but anyway, um, so obviously like not knowing the grounding of, of the story um, is potentially, means that you don't get as much out of it, but I still thought it was a very clever and meta sort of book he did a really great interview on lolly editions website that i will link down below if it's of interest to you and it's essentially so it's three narratives that are all like distinctly different telling different stories there's a woman who um is obsessed with climbing the tallest peaks in the world and then has an accident on everest um that was definitely my favorite and then the second story is about a man that goes missing in like a rural farmland area and they search for his body and then uh the third story is about a young um like new writer and an older playwright who comes together to work on a failing play um it might definitely my order of enjoyment was like the first story was my favorite the second was my second favorite and the third was my least favorite that's just because i don't i don't always love books about plays like books are within a book if you know what i mean but um i thought this was so smart so all of the stories are really woven together through this idea of storytelling and what it means to tell a story and I feel like it's really pertinent considering so much what I'm what I'm thinking about at the moment and if you saw my chat with Tom about this idea of like a universal truth or the idea that knowledge is um subjective and there is only um the only truth to an experience is for the individual experiencing it and like memory is such a malleable thing that we all deal with and like searching for an objective truth is frankly a waste of time um, and I feel like he was saying so much about that in here and then also the first story about um this climber which is really interesting and you the way that he reveals the um tragic accident that happens to her um is like through an email and I think that choice of like oral response instead of um like first person direct narrative telling the reader what has happened is really interesting and it's entangled with her experience of like who she was before who she was now and I related to a lot of that when it came to like physical disability and illness and um I'm also very wary of reading books um like often that portray physical disability that are like can be so intensively done but I think this was so thoughtful and um contemplative of those like universal human experiences when it comes to loss and longing and how like no matter if it's physical disability or whatever it is that happens to be a marker and a milestone in your life how you reflect on the previous self you had and the self that you are now and that really gave me a lot to think about so yeah I really enjoyed this collection um I would pick it up if you're fans of like very literary short stories or like more metaphysical thinking I feel like Kieran might like this maybe I'll send it to him Anyway, that's all I have to say on that. I'm going to start a new book this evening. It's the football. I won't be watching. Um, so I'll be reading, but I will start that in another vlog. So I'll see you guys soon. Bye.